brothers and sisters, welcome to another day where we can exalt, we can praise, we can bless the Lord with our voices, with our hearts, with all minds together. I want to read for you a small article that says, what is the definition of salvation for a Christian? And my explanation, a concise definition of salvation can be summed up in one word, deliverance. But deliverance from what? When the Israelites came out of Egypt and reached the Red Sea, Moses told them to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. That's in Exodus 14, 13. In this case, God provided a physical deliverance for Israel from the army of Egypt. In the New Testament, the term salvation describes two essential components of a Christian life. One, being delivered from the penalty of sin which is eternal debt, and that is in Romans 6, 23. Number two, being delivered from mortality and given the gift of eternal life, and that is found in John 3, 15. Salvation is very important. The Bible calls it so great a salvation, and that is found in Hebrews 2, 3. Salvation is about, all about how a Christian can live a better life today and ultimately live forever in the future. How are we saved? Ephesians 2, 8 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Today we are, um, today is entitled Evangelism, Evangelism Sunday, and I want to encourage us to Meditate upon God's word and to know that he is there at all times. May I encourage you to stand at this time as we go into a word of prayer to begin our service. Let's bow our head. Father, we thank you this morning for this day that you have made. We will bless you with all that we have. Father, our minds are in tune with you, O oh God. Our hearts are in one accord. Our whole body, O oh God, we have we have woken up this morning with songness of mind, O oh God, that we can reason one with the other. There is peace, there is joy, there is love, O oh God, abounding in us. Father, we thank you that you have given us this life so abundantly, O oh God, that as we look around us, O oh God, we can see the wonders that you have made, that your creation exalts it, O oh God. So who are we, O oh God, that you'll be mindful? So we will praise you, we will exalt your name, we will magnify the name. Because you are great and awesome in all your ways. Father, we bless you this morning, oh God. Our lips rejoice, oh God. Our hearts are glad, filled with gratitude, oh God. For this day we can see, we can be a witness of your grace and your mercy extended to us. Father, we will not take it for granted because so many have not woken up this morning. There's so many trials that have taken place. But Father, by grace, this morning we woke up and we saw it was good, oh God, because your hands are ever at work. We thank you for your faithfulness, oh God. We thank you, oh God, for your mercy for day by day. You are continually providing, oh God. You are continually supplying all our needs, oh God. So mighty God, we thank you this morning for all that you're doing, all that you're about to do, the healing that is taking place during this COVID season, oh God. Pray, O oh God, that we'll be obedient to follow all the guidelines of oh God, that we may be safe, O oh God, that we'll keep, O oh God, ever more in our minds, all the caution that is necessary, O oh God. Father, we just thank you, O oh God. We thank you that through it all, we can see you in the midst, O oh God, that you are still in control, no matter the situation, O oh God. We will continue to give you the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Father, we thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. At this time, I would like to invite the worship team to begin our first song. Good morning, everyone. Hallelujah. We bless the Lord who would be found worthy to deliver us from the penalty of sin. What? None but Jesus. Amen. amen. He alone is worthy. He's worthy, he alone is worthy to worship and adore the Lamb of God, victorious. Redemption 
Sister Pam for leading us in worship this morning. And of course, as you mentioned, today is a Evangelism Sunday, as we have designated our Sundays. First Sunday is Family Sunday. Second Sunday is uh, Evangelism Sunday. Third Sunday is Prayer and Deliverance Sunday. And fourth Sunday, of course, is Teaching Sunday. And every fifth Sunday, we have what we call Dress Down. Um, although very, not very many people dressing down anymore, but Dress Down Sunday anyhow. <laughs> yes, I know, I know. I think we get so accustomed to dressing up, we don't know how to dress down. Yeah? <laughs> so, welcome to Evangelism Sunday. And of course, it is not that we do not... Um, emphasize evangelism on other Sundays or we don't ev emphasize uh, prayer and deliverance on other Sundays. It's just that we want to remind ourselves of our mission statement. Yeah? And, and our Sundays kind of line up with our mission statement. Our mission statement says we are a caring evangelistic church united in worship and praise and promoting spiritual growth and development through various ministries, and that takes all of those uh, Sundays into consideration. First Sunday, family, caring. Second Sunday, evangelism. Third Sunday, worship and, and, and deliverance and prayer. Fourth Sunday, teaching, developing our people uh, educationally, spiritual education, that is. And of course, on a, on a fifth Sunday, family Sunday, we go back caring dress down Sunday sorry we go back to caring so I trust that as you uh, walk with the Lord throughout the week this coming week that God will give you an opportunity to share the gospel with someone share what God has given to you with someone else all right evangelism is not just about going up on a pulpit and being an evangelist if, if evangelism is about Sharing what you have, what you have found in Christ, how Christ has delivered you, how he has blessed you. And we heard what deliverance and salvation means. Sharing that with someone else, sharing your faith, sharing your experience with Christ, uh, with someone else. Amen? Don't ever stop doing that. We have to do that until Jesus comes. We have to evangelize until Jesus comes. We are to win the loss until Jesus comes. Amen? Every, anytime we stop evangelizing, we are going to fossilize. We are going to just crumble and die. Because evangelism is the lifeblood of the church. Evangelism is what keeps the church alive and growing. Amen? So welcome. I trust that as we worship God together this morning, that we will be richly blessed. And wherever you are, wherever you are, those of you who would be listening to this or looking at this service 
uh, sometime later on this week. I pray that God's goodness and his grace and his favor will be upon you. Amen. That you'll never forget that every morning that you awake, every morning that God allows you to see, it is another indication of his grace and his favor upon your life. So God bless you today, and I pray that our worship will be a rich and blessed one. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your service. Good morning, brothers and sisters. See you here. It was a rainy morning, but I think it's going to be changing into something a bit sunny. We thank God for his mercies. We need the rain as well as the sun. So we take both a grateful heart. Um, coming up on the 20th, and that will be Saturday coming, Women in Ministry Virtual Meeting. That's at 4 p.m. 20th, Saturday, Women in Ministry Virtual Meeting. That's 4 p.m. The 28th, we should have or we convene 2018 AGM Meeting. Annual General Meeting, that's on the 28th. We convened after the service. And of course, today is the 14th, we are having children's ministry now in the hall and that would be taking place also on the 20th every two weeks so on the 28th we would also have that children's ministry coming up in april don't forget the 10th good friday of course and that special friday we would have our baptism starts at 8 a.m early that's an early church service 8 a.m We'll have a baptism, Good Friday. It's on the 10th of April. And on the 17th of April, we have our small group leadership training, mentorship training. Okay, small group leadership training, mentorship training on the 17th of April. That's from 9.30 to 12.30. And of course, 11th and the 25th would be the children's ministry once again. And not too far away, because this, this time is going rather quickly, it would be in May. And of course, on the 9th of May would be Mother's Day. So we have all that time to plan, to plan sorry, our Mother's Day celebrations. Those are all the announcements I have. What I'm going to do right now is just call birthdays coming up for this week. Tunde Akimbala on the 15th. Patricia Murphy Prescott, she's on the 16th. Elma George on the 18th. Gavin Bishop also on the 18th. Brother John Gammon, uh, faithful brother, he's on the 20th. And I think, pastor, if I'm not mistaken, 94. 94 years old. Still going strong. We are thankful for his service here at St. John's. Faithful brother, he is. Brother Gammon, you know, that would be on a Saturday. We're going to be wishing you all the best. And those who can call, please call. Wish him all the best on the 20th of Saturday. That would be his birthday. And also on a version on the 16th, will be Mr. and Mrs. Antoine. Their anniversary coming up on the 16th of this month. Jacksons had their anniversary on the 12th. That was Friday. And a, a real gala event that was. I think it was at the Hyatt. Yes. And um, we didn't have them doing that, you know, ceremonial kiss. And we know that we need to have that ceremonial kiss. And we will have it right now. The bride and groom, Mr. and Mrs. Jackson. But this is not ceremonial kiss. Ah, well done, well done. God continue to richly bless two of you and your family for the days and years to come. Amen. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we must will have to be. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, 
offer them along with ourselves. Lord, we offer our hearts to you. We offer our minds to you. We offer our past, our present, and our future to you. All that we have, we give it to you, Lord. Take and use both the gift and the givers to build your kingdom, to minister good news Lord, to encourage those who are discouraged. Use us, O oh God. Use us as individuals and use us collectively as a congregation to be a blessing with all those that we come into contact. Father, bless and continue to guide, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, you have won the victory. You have won it all. For me, I can declare and I know you can Hallelujah. do the same. We give God's praise. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have won the victory. sing of the victory that we have in Christ Jesus. And we declare that victory, Lord, even in the face of trials that we'll be going through. And God, as our faces differ this morning, so our trials, our situations, our circumstances differ. Some of us, God, we are like Samson this morning, facing challenges from the Philistines. 
Some of us, God, we are like David, facing our Goliaths. Lord, for some of us, we are like Daniel, feeling as though we are in the lion's den this morning. God, for some of us, we are like Elijah, thinking that it would be best if we just curl up somewhere and give up. But this morning, Father, we declare in the face of everything that we are going through, That we have the victory this morning. Hallelujah. 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 We declare that God is a good God. That Satan is defeated. That we serve a mighty God this morning. We declare it into the very atmosphere, Lord. Help us this morning to believe it ourselves. And to walk in that victory. By faith, Lord, we claim it this morning. By faith, we claim the victory. By faith, we claim the victory. By faith, we claim it this morning, God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you that we could speak things into being. Your word tells us, God, that uh, there is power in our tongue, in our, in our speech, in our words. Lord, we speak what you are speaking over us this morning. We speak life and victory and hope and peace. As we face this, this Easter season, Lord, and we look towards Calvary, where it appeared as though everything was gone and lost and dead. But God, we remember this morning that after Good Friday, there was a glorious Saturday and then there was an Easter Sunday when, hallelujah, death could not hold him down. But he rose triumphantly over death, over the grave, over demons, over the devil. And this morning, God, we declare that very hope in our own situations, in our own circumstances. We draw our strength from the resurrection of Jesus this morning. We draw our hope from that resurrection. Hallelujah. 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 Glory, 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 glory. We thank you, Lord God. We thank you that we could base our hope on something that historically took place. We could base our hope on your word can base our hope on that tugging in our own spirits, that travailing that takes place where the Holy Spirit is travailing in us, groaning until the day of the full redemption, not only of mankind, but of all creation. We look forward to that day. We thank you for that hope that keeps us Alive. Bless your word to our hearts this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. And part of that prayer that I prayed this morning is from a, a WhatsApp text that I got from Brother Carl Campbell. Wonderful. Carl don't usually send out those nice texts, but this morning it was great. <laughs> You know, that sometimes we feel like Daniel in the, in the lion's den. Sometimes we feel like Hannah, you know, like we can't get our breakthroughs. But, but God is good. God is good. God is good. It doesn't matter how long it takes. If God promises, he will perform. He will bring it to pass. Yeah? He will bring it to pass. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians again. And for those of you who were here last week, you'll remember that we started a series, just two sermons in the series though, but you started a series on the transformed life, living the transformed life, living the transformed life, and the basic uh, theme or the basic thesis for this series is that 
since Christ has done so much for us, and, and this is the theme of the book of Ephesians, since we are heirs and joint heirs with Christ, since we have been redeemed, since we have uh, become heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, since God has called us from since the very foundation of the earth, since he has sealed us by his spirit, since he has done all of these great and wonderful things for us, we must now live out those truths in our daily lives. What we believe must now be translated in what we do. You can't believe something or say you believe something and then do something that is completely contrary or contradictory to what you say you believe. If you say, I believe that I could go up on the hall of justice and I could throw myself down and angels will hold me up. If you say you believe that, then you have to do it. I'm not sending any of you to do that this morning, all right? But I'm just saying that to say that your, your faith must be followed up with works. That's the thesis of Ephesians. And Paul says in the book of Ephesians that we have been transformed through the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has transformed me. I'm a new creation. I'm a brand new man. All things have passed away and all things have become new. I have a new spirit. I have a new life. I have a new hope. If that is so, then it must show itself in a transformed life. I must be different. I must live a different life. And last week, we heard that a transformed life shows itself through changed words. You can't be cussing. You can't be bad talking and gossiping. You, you have your words must change. Transformed life shows itself through transformed words. Your words must now be seasoned with salt. Your words must now be words that encourage people, not pull down. Your words must build up, not destroy. Your words must be positive, not negative. Amen? And then we said, a transformed life also shows itself not only in a change in changed words, but in a changed wrath. Our anger now must change. The Bible says you must be angry, but do not sin. And don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Because that gives place for the devil. It leads to bitterness and judgmental behavior. Too many of us, we get angry and we sin. The Bible doesn't stop you from getting angry, but it does stop you from committing sin. Amen? Amen. And you can be angry without committing sin. And today I want to, to take two other words. If we say that we are changed, we have a transformed life, that change must show itself in our work. In our work, go with me, chapter 4, <clears throat> chapter 4 of Ephesians. I'm going to read the entire passage again, verse 25 to 32. Verse 25 to 32. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Nor give place to the devil. And verse 28 says, Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, that means work, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Verse 29, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good, for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Verse 30, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, 
by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Verse 32 and the final verse. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Even as God in Christ forgave you. So, we begin today with this concept of work. God changes our words, he changes our wrath, he changes our work. And I want to begin with a quote. A quote from Reverend Dr. Terry Anderson puts it this way. He said, there is no greater evidence of a changed heart or a changed life than to see a former thief seek honest employment, become concerned about those unemployed, and even give some of his hard-earned wages to alleviate the problems of the poor. There is no greater evidence of a changed life than to see a former thief seek honest employment. Someone who made a living by dishonest means, when that person has been transformed, you see the evidence of that by that person no longer making a living from dishonest means but seeking honest employment. Honest employment. And that's, the, that's only the first part of, of the transformed life. You no longer steal, but you seek honest employment. But a transformed life even goes further than that. You become concerned now about the unemployed because you were once unemployed. In a sense. You become concerned about those who are, don't have a job. And brothers and sisters, there are some of us who believe that church and Christianity is only about coming to church and singing and praising God and lifting up your hands. But there is a theology of work that is in the Bible that we ought to be mindful of. God blesses those who work and work hard. And in fact, work, there are some people who believe that work is a punishment for man. We see work as a punishment. Every Monday morning, we have to get up and go to work. Oh my God. It's like that is hard labor, like we're going to prison, like we're going to, 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 you know. Work is good. Work Work was not a punishment for the sin that Adam and Eve did in the garden, you know. Work was not a punishment. Go back and read it for yourself in the book of Genesis. God gave them work to do before they sinned. Remember God told Adam, and Eve, Adam, you know, multiply, replenish. You take care of this, these things that I have given to you. Take care of the, of the garden. God gave Adam good, honest, hard work to do. Because God knew that employment is an important part of the fulfillment of man's needs and the fulfillment of man's desires. Work is good. Amen. 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 Work is not punishment. All right? It was made a little more difficult by the fall, but work is honorable. Work is an honorable exercise. And so that's why Paul says, listen, stop thiefing and work hard. Be honest. Work honestly. And I want, to, I want to deal a little bit with that honest work this morning. Just a little bit. Working involves working hard without stealing time. Now there are some of you who might say, well, I don't thief in a pastor. I don't thief. But anytime you're reaching to work late, leaving early, and you're expecting the same pay, you're thiefing. You're thiefing the boss's time. And then there are some of us 
We don't only thief time, we thief things. It's just a little piece of paper, man. It's just a ream of paper. Or oh, it might be just, you know, a, 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 a stapling machine. Push it in your bag and go on home with it. That's stealing, you know. I hear no amens this morning, but that's all right. When you're calling sick, and not one single thing wrong with you. You're stealing because you are earning money under false pretense. And this isn't today. You have 3,000 people working at, at Wasa who don't go to work. And, and don't, don't, don't even get me started about government work. Don't, don't get me started there. Don't, don't let me go there because that is a whole next kettle of fish by itself. Lord Jesus. People signing in and by 7 o'clock they're back home. And they're getting a full day's pay. But I don't want to go there. I really don't want to go there. I know I might mash plenty of all your phone this morning. And even some people might be listening via the internet. But if the point is clear. Stealing is not just taking up cash and putting it in your pocket. Getting cash under false pretense. Even buying stolen items. You know there are people who like to get a bargain. They like to get a deal. I don't know if, 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 if it happens still, you know, but there was a time when there were these guys who would go into stores. Steal things in the stores, run back out the store and sell it to people on the side of the road. A lot of the people selling on the side of the road, and I'm not saying all. I'm not saying all. But there's a lot of it taking place. And we who like to get a deal and a bargain, take it on the side. Hmm? What about those of you when you're going to a store? And the cashier gave you an extra $20. And you realize it's an extra $20. You're going to say, well, wait now, boy. God bless me this morning. That's not a blessing. <laughs> That's not a blessing. That is stealing. You know that is not your money. The Bible says, let him who stole, stop it. Stop stealing. Work for your money. Amen. What about, let's come into the church now and talk about a little stealing that takes place in church. The Bible says, will a man steal from God? Huh? Can a man rob God? Can you steal from God? Yes, according to Malachi chapter 3. We rob God every time we fail to give our, our tithes and our offering. We rob God. When we do not give our tithes and our offering. We are working. God has blessed you with a job. God has opened a door for you. You prayed for it. You came and you asked the church. Pray for me to get a job pastor. Pray for me to get a job uh, deacons. We come to prayer and fast and we pray. God I want to open a door for me. And we get the job. God bless us every morning with health and strength to go to work. When it is time to give back to God now, we're back squeezing. We're holding back. Hmm? When you hold back offering from God like that, you are stealing. You are robbing God. According to the book of Malachi, give to God what he deserves. Give to God what belongs to him. The tithe is not yours. According to scripture, the tithe belongs to God. The proportion, and, let me, and some of you may, may say, well, pastor, tithing is not New Testament. Okay, what is New Testament? New Testament is everything, 100%. In the Old Testament, it was 10%. New Testament is 100%. New Testament is in proportion to what God has given to you. If God has blessed you richly, then you give richly. You don't hold back from you determine a proportion of your income that is realistically showing gratitude to God. What proportion? Hmm? If 
it is a tie, then give a tie. If it is a hundred percent, then give him a hundred percent. Amen? But I come back to the point I was making earlier that nothing is wrong with working. Work honestly. Amen? And the Bible says that it's not only church work is good work. Eh? There are some people who believe that it's only Christian work. Only when I do ministry that I'm working for the Lord. No. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians chapter 3, he says, whatever you do, do it with all of your heart, yeah, as unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. If you're a seamstress, sew your clothes as unto the Lord. That's good work. If you're an engineer, be an engineer as unto the Lord. That is God's work. If you are a contractor, be a contractor as unto the Lord. If you are a doctor, be a doctor as unto the Lord. If you are a social worker, be a social worker as unto the Lord. Whatever work you do, whatever your hands find to do, amen, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all of your heart. Do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto man. When you go to work in the morning, it, 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 does, it really doesn't matter what, what the boss says or what the, the, the co-worker says or what the supervisor says. You're not working for them. You're working with them, but you're not working for them. You're working for the Lord. Amen? Can I get an amen this morning? God changes our work. When you become a Christian, you become a child of God, you no longer work just to please men. Your work now becomes part of your worship to God. Amen? Your work becomes a part of your worship. And so don't think that it's only when you come to church you're worshiping. Oh my God. We get this secular and sacred division and we, and we split up everything into sacred and secular. So when you're out there working, you figure, well, it's all right. I'm working for the man. No, you're not working for the man. God closes that gap between the sacred and the secular. Once you become a child of God, there is nothing that is secular for you anymore. Your money belongs to God. Your clothes belongs to God. Your work belongs to God. Everything you do, you must do it now as unto the Lord. You now have become a spectacle and an instrument being used by God for his glory. So I challenge us today, those of you who use the steel, stop it. Stop it. Jesus worked hard. That was part of his, his ministry and his life. He was a carpenter. And if, you are, if, if in a village you are known as a carpenter, you've got to be known as a good carpenter. You see this, this building? You look, at, you look at the work that is done up there. That work that was done was done more than 150 years ago. And it is still looking good. It's still lasting. It's beautiful. You know why? Because the contractor knew that what he was doing, he was doing it as unto the Lord. Amen. He worked and he worked hard and he worked well. He worked with excellence. Jesus worked hard. Paul worked hard. Paul was a tent maker. Whenever he, his, his, his ministry was, wasn't able to support him, he did his work. He did his ministry. He continued as a tent maker. And don't only work, brothers and sisters, don't only work so you could provide for yourself and your family. What, what, what Paul says in Ephesians, he says, you must now be concerned about those who don't have, look at verse 28, that you may give something to him who has need. Hallelujah. That's, the, that's one of the purposes of work. It's not just to provide for yourself, but you must now be concerned about the unemployed. Are you concerned about those who have no jobs? Those who have, who, 
God gave them a, an ability. God gave them a talent. God gave them something that they could do and they cannot use it. Why? Because the government. The government. Well, it's not just the government. It's you and I. What can we do to help those who are unemployed? Hmm? What can we do to assist those who are unemployed? And no work, none whatsoever is this, is is dishonorable. All work that is done for the glory of God is honorable. Amen? I move on. God transforms our words. He transforms our wrath. He transforms our work. But finally, the Bible says here that he transforms our walk. God transforms our walk. Verse 30 to 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. All of the aforementioned evils, lying and stealing and, and the utterances of evil words and all of those things grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve the Spirit of God when we lie. We grieve the Spirit of God when we steal. We grieve the Spirit of God when we use words that are, that are, that are, that are destructive. It grieves the Spirit. And Paul uses the word grieve here because he wants to show us that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a force that comes over you when you hear a certain song. The Holy Spirit doesn't get on you and throw you down and leave you. That's not the Spirit of God. That is not the Spirit of God. Please hear me. You don't catch the Spirit. The Spirit is not being thrown around like a basketball. You don't catch the Spirit. The Spirit is a person. Because you, you can't grieve a force. You cannot grieve something that is not, doesn't have a personality. The reason Paul uses the word grieve is because he wants us to understand that it is only a person who can be grieved. The Spirit of God is a person. And the Spirit of God loves you. Just as God loves you and Jesus loves you, this I know. The Spirit of God loves you. Because you can't grieve for something that you do not love. You cannot. You can never grieve for somebody who you didn't like. Yeah? You could annoy me if I don't like you. You could bother me. You could irritate me. You could get on my nerves. But you can't grieve me. I wouldn't grieve. The Spirit of God can be grieved. And the Bible also tells us that the Spirit of God can be resisted. Amen? Amen? You can resist the spirit, you know. Oh yes. There are some people who feel that, you know, when the spirit comes, that, that you can't resist him. If he tells you to get up and jump, you have to get up and jump. Or if he tells you to roll on the ground, you have to, that is not true. We resist the spirit every day. Every day some of us resist the spirit. Whenever the spirit comes and he prompts you, to either say something, you're, you're driving in a maxi going home and something tells you to share the gospel with somebody sitting at your side and you say, no, you're resisting the spirit. Mm -hmm. You're resisting the spirit. When the spirit tells you to go and forgive the brother who said something wrong to you or forgive the sister and you refuse to do it, you are resisting the spirit. How is it that you could resist the spirit when it comes to those things but when it's time for you to fall down and make noise and, and, and talk in all kind of languages, you can't resist. Come on. Father, have mercy. <laughs> Can be resisted. Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. I just want to read that very quickly for you. Acts 7, 51. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Acts 7, 51. I ain't stopping in. Don't worry. Acts 7, 51. Read it with me. This is, this, is, this is 
This is the address of Stephen when he was addressing the, 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 the Israelites just before they stoned him to death. And Stephen is telling the Israelites, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. So the Spirit of God can be resisted. Hmm? The Spirit of God can also be blasphemed. The spirit can be blasphemed. And blasphemy of the spirit is not just, and I, I've, I've said this to you before, I've taught you this before. This blasphemy of the spirit is not just resisting the spirit once or saying something bad about the spirit once. No. Because the blasphemy of the spirit, the Bible tells us, is the only sin that cannot be forgiven. The only sin that cannot be forgiven, if you commit the sin, you will not be forgiven, is blasphemy against the Spirit. What is that? Blasphemy against the Spirit is knowing the truth that the Spirit is revealing to you and choosing to believe a lie. That is blasphemy of the Spirit. Where you choose not to obey the Spirit. You choose not to believe what the Spirit is doing. And you choose to, to give credit to the devil for something that the spirit is doing. For example, there was a case in the Bible where the scripture says that Jesus was casting out demons out of, out of a man. Cast out demons out of the man. And the Jews looked at him and said what? That he is casting out these demons, what? Via Beelzebub. So in other words, they were saying to Jesus, you are only doing that and the only power you have to do that is power you're getting from the devil. See? Be careful. Be careful that you do not blaspheme the spirit by over and over and over and over again denying the power of God and giving credit to the devil. The Bible puts it this way in the book of Romans. They know the truth of God but they chose to give credit to the creature more than to the creator who is blessed forever. Now, the spirit could be resisted, the spirit could be quenched, could be uh, blasphemed and the spirit can be quenched. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 do not quench the Spirit of God. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Do not quench the Spirit. Don't quench the Spirit. What does quenching the Spirit mean? Now, now, resisting the Spirit and blaspheming the Spirit are sins of the unbeliever. The unbeliever resists the unbeliever could blaspheme. But it is the believer who quenches. Are you with me? The believer quenches the spirit by not allowing the spirit to do what he wants to do through you. By allowing self to take control rather than the spirit to take control. By stifling the promptings of the spirit. And by suppressing the convictions that the Spirit brings. That's how we quench the Spirit. Amen? We quench the Spirit. We quench Him. We, we, we suppress His activity in our lives. We suppress the conviction that comes from the Spirit. When you, when you, 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 you are convicted by the Spirit, the Spirit of God speaks to your heart. You acknowledge you're a sinner. You acknowledge that you need Christ. You know that the gospel applies to you. But instead of standing up and saying, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. We quench the spirit. We sit down. Say, I'm not moving. I ain't want that pastor to feel that I'm going up there because of him. I'm not moving. We quench the spirit that way. The spirit is grieved. When we lie, when we steal, when we communicate corruptly. When we are unkind to one another, look at, go 
go back to Ephesians chapter 4. That, that, that grieves the Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Spirit of God. Let bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, let it be put away from you. Why? Because those things grieve the Spirit of God. And that's why when, you, when, you, when you're praying or, or you, you come to service, you come to church, and you know that some of these things are actively taking place in your life, and you worship God like if nothing is happening, that grieves the spirit. We need, to, we need to begin to deal with some of those issues that are, that are quenching the spirit of God in our lives. We need to let the spirit have his way. Let bitterness go. Let anger go. Let clamor go. Let unkindness go. When you, when you come to the altar... That's what you're saying to God. God, I really want to live out the transformed life. I want to live out this transformed life. I'm struggling, yes. I'm having some challenges, yes. But I want to live out the transformed life. Help me, Jesus. That's what you're saying when you come to the altar. You can't come to God with bitterness in your heart and malice. Those, that is probably why some of us are going through what we're going through. You can't be praying to God, worshiping God, and there is anger in you, and there's malice in you, and there's bitterness in you. Get rid of it. Be kind to one another, the Bible says. Be kind. Be kind every day. Be kind every week. When someone is, is being mean to you or trying to destroy your character, your self-esteem, be kind. Be tender-hearted. And then the Bible says we must forgive one another. Forgive one another. This is, this is the hardest one, I think. This is the difficult one. Forgiving. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. The King James Version says, forgiving one another for Christ's sake. For Christ's sake, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Oh my God, there is a, there is a, a morsel of truth in there, brothers and sisters. God does, is not forgiving you simply because you ask for forgiveness, you know. God forgives you for Christ's sake. Mm. It is because of Christ that God forgives me. Not because I bow or I cry. It's for Christ's sake. And that's why you must forgive. For Christ's sake, man. Forgive. Let go off of that person you have been holding on to. Forgive for Christ's sake. God forgave me for the sake of Christ. God forgives me knowing that I will sin again tomorrow. God still forgives me. And you holding on to this person, you're holding on to the, whatever they did to you at five years ago. They're holding on, you're holding on to what they did to you 10 years ago. You've sinned every day. And God is forgiving you every day. But you don't want to forgive? God forgives us completely and gloriously. So much so that he grants adoption to us. He, he, he brings us into his family. And God keeps on reaching out to man. He keeps on reaching out to us. He keeps coming after us. He keeps challenging us. He keeps pursuing us. Just so that for Christ's sake, he could forgive us. Let the transforming power of Christ change your words. 
let people see that it is no longer you who live but it's Christ who lives in you let the world see that you are a new creature in Christ a new creation all things have passed away and all things have become new Jesus is able to transform you hallelujah he's able to transform your heart to transform your mind to transform your words to transform the anger that is in you to make you into a, a patient person a loving person he's able he's able not just to heal and to and to deliver but he's able to change your anger he's able to destroy that anger that is destroying you he's able to transform your work and and make you you know some of you don't like your work right now well you would love it for Christ's sake for Christ's sake he will change your walk how you walk how you how you live your life is able to transform for Christ's sake for God's sake be transformed be renewed in the spirit of your mind allow God to use you as a display of his transforming power amen and amen bow your heads with me and if you are here this morning in the presence of God we thank God for the fact that he's still working on us we may not be all that he wants us to be but we thank God that we are more better than we used to be so father this morning we ask that you would take charge Lord, may your Holy Spirit not only convict us this morning, but may your Holy Spirit transform us, move us from where we are to where you would have us to be. Move us, oh God, even if it is just a short distance from where we are now. Take us, Lord, to higher ground. Plant our feet this morning on solid ground. Lift us up, lift our minds, lift our hearts, lift our lives, our walk, our words, our work, and our wrath. Hear our prayer this morning, Father. We pray that someone this morning who may not know you as Lord and Savior of their lives would acknowledge their sin but also believe that Christ died for their sins, rose again for their justification, and would seek now to live the new life charted for them in Christ Jesus. Bless and guide now, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Let's stand as we bring our service to a close. Father, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us all, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your day.